Hey, how's, how's everybody, everybody doing, doing today? It's Andy, hey, and we are here live with the Dev Talk, Talk Show. show. Uh, I've got uh, Rich Ross here, and I've got uh, Chris Gomez, and we are kicking off another show because it's Wednesday night, and here we are with the Dev Talk Show. Uh, yeah, so Chris, we're going to talk about Signal R tonight, and uh, Signal R is cool. Signal R is is really, I could be wrong, but I always get the feeling this is one of your favorites. Oh yeah, yeah. Signal R is. I think it's fair to say that that this is the technology that that got me into a regular like speaking role on the local user group circuit. So yeah. It is cool. It's it's nice to know that we can have a broad community, right? So, okay. I don't know, it's, yeah. Hey, listen. Before you start, can I just yeah. make a mention? I know we've got viewers yep. and and people listening. So let's remind everybody that this is an interactive show. If you have questions, please put them in. If you have comments or suggestions or something like that, put them in the chat. If you're logged into Twitch, if you're watching us live, you can log into Twitch and you know you can use the chat. So tonight we're going to focus on Signal R for ASP.NET Core, specifically cool. ASP.NET Core 3.1. So if Good. you're here thinking about Signal R for .NET Framework, it still exists. You, you can still use it with ASP.NET 4, but not going to cover any code in that tonight. The concepts are pretty much the same. Um, the other thing that I don't think we're going to get to, which I'd love to do in a future show, is using Signal R. Are in Azure Functions, which I think is a fantastic uh, way to go serverless with this. And I think that's a show in itself. Mm, and we're cool. also not going to see what's going on in .NET 5, which I don't see a whole lot of change with this. But I'll tell you what, with .NET 5 Preview 8 dropping today and .NET 5 being declared feature complete, I sense a show on the horizon. Yeah. So Feature complete. Definitely. That's exciting, by yeah. the way. Yeah, Can you... .NET 5, right? Go ahead. Is it worth taking 30 seconds and just talking real quick around what you mean with Signal R and Azure Functions? Yeah. 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 As a matter of so, fact, we have a comment here from Kayaking saying he is new, or he or she, excuse awesome. me, awesome. I am new to both Signal R and .NET in general. Welcome to our show. Yep. We love when people are new to .NET. Uh, we like, you know, we like both kind of viewers, right? Like it's great to get a, like a long-term perspective from someone who's been doing things a long time. At the same time though, we get someone like kayaking here who's new to .NET and can come in with a totally different perspective, which we find really interesting on the show. Yeah. And uh, that's really good to know. So Chris can frame the conversation, someone uh, for that so, kind of thing. So Signal R is about enabling the real-time web. And why, why do we need a real-time web? Like, what does that even mean? Um, the web was different even five, six, seven, eight years ago, but really we had some of the same things we have today generally speaking like the web is a pretty simple thing uh this th these are my great drawing skills here this is a server right <laughs> this is a this is a this is a web server i thought we were serverless go ahead sorry right yeah <laughs> and 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 uh this is somebody's laptop okay now in your laptop you've got a web browser and it doesn't matter which web browser you use. And when you go to your address bar or your bookmarks or you just start typing or you click a link, pretty much the same thing always happens, right? Your web browser contacts a web server and gets back files or links to files, maybe image files. It gets back the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that it needs to run. This might be a GET request or a POST request or some other type of request, it really doesn't matter. But it's it's a request response system. That's, pr I know there are some, some things have happened in the last you know 15 years, we have Ajax, which is like the worst named thing in the world because we don't use XML. The XML, it's, it actually stands for asynchronous JavaScript and JSON. It's just that the, the X is silent in JSON. So uh, we have that capability, but notice everything is being initiated by what we call the client or the browser, the web browser, to get that first web page back, you know, uh, maybe a GET request happens, and here comes index.html, and that index.html says, "Oh, guess what? In order to use me effectively, you need some CSS, you need some JavaScript, you need some images. Those come back too." Then, in a lot of modern frameworks, React, Vue, Blazor, 
it doesn't even have to be a modern framework, right? You could be um, a modern client side framework. You could be using a modern server side framework like ASP.NET MVC, Ruby on, I mean, it could be Ruby on Rails, Python and Flask. Like, I don't care what it is. We will often in our client code, write some JavaScript or maybe TypeScript or whatever, or whatever you enjoy using to go and get more data. That's the Ajax part, right? So that's still the client making a call out and saying, hey, I need this little bit of data and back comes some JSON and then that gets rendered and now and now the page fills out and then the CSS gets filled in and the link you're just about to click gets moved because the data got back just in time. That's the way the web works generally. But here's what we can't do, or at least what we normally can't do very well. Um, what if something's changed to the data? What if what if you're a news site and there's a breaking news story and you wish that every client could get a breaking news banner across the top? Well, I guess you have to wait for the web browser to, to call back in and, and ask for a refresh of the page or, or maybe an update to the headlines, right? Yeah, yeah and that's what we, we used to traditionally do. We might have a timer on there, you know, every like... 30 seconds, like maybe I should refresh my, my page. Right. And, and that again, though, was happening from the, from the client, the client would have a timer on it, the client being the browser. And you know, that, that it sort of got the job done. Right. But you had to have that timer and you had to be looking for specific pieces of information, you know, whatever it was. Right. It, it was, it was a workaround. Right. right. So signal R changes the, the game by, by using, it, it uses a technology today, generally speaking, it uses WebSockets. And if you're newer to web development, you're probably listening to us talk and say like, WebSockets, those are new? Well, there was a time when we didn't have WebSockets, which was bi-directional communication between the, the client, the laptop, and the web server. Now we have WebSockets, right? And WebSockets are probably easier to use than ever. Um, but there was also a time when using WebSockets was not necessarily easy or supported. Yeah. Right. Uh, your your yeah. web server might not support it. Uh, a router in between you and the web server might not support it. Your operating system might not support it. Your browser might not support it. So what happened is folks like the folks at Google and the folks who, who were inventing Gmail and things like that, they still wanted a solution. So a second solution that was pretty popular is called long polling. And the way long polling works is the client goes ahead and makes an HTTP connection that the server doesn't respond to right away. It just holds on to it. And it holds on to it until it does have that up to the second data to send back. And then it sends it back. But what if that thing times out? Well, the client code says, oh, but I'm long polling. And it's almost like I like to think of long polling like long fishing. I cast out a long line. And then I reel it in. And then when it finally comes back in, one of two things happen. Either I got a bite because there was an update that I want to get back, or I finally got the lure back in and there was nothing. So what do I do as the client? I cast it out again. And the folks who, who created Gmail actually implemented all this in your browser on the web server. Signal R implemented it for you. There were a couple right, other- By the way, when, when uh... When um, Gmail came out, how everybody thought like, oh, my gosh. That this was is so blue. cool. Right. Yeah, we called it Web 2.0, right? Because yeah. the web was now becoming <laughs> right. real time. Web 2.0. Uh, oh. Firefox and the Mozilla browser supported a standard called server send events. So a few years ago, we were in this place where the combination of browsers and servers left you in a spot where you as the developer, were you going to write the code to support all of this and to fall back and to figure out what, uh, each client, each each one of your users that was connecting could use. And then to top it all off, one, just because you got all that figured out, now you kind of need, you know, you kind of need some, a library. You need to write your own kind of library or something to make it a little bit easier to send these messages back and forth. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you're going to have to write code that says, well, am I on a WebSocket? Use the WebSocket. Am I long polling? Use the long poll. Am I on server sent events? And so what SignalR does is SignalR says, don't worry about this. We have it covered. You write on your server, you use an abstraction called the hub. And on the client, you connect to hubs. And when you're in your code, when you connect to a hub, you can also subscribe to, um, to, to listen for functions to be called in both directions. 
that's really cool. What it makes it look like to you as a developer, this is what it feels like. It feels like you in your JavaScript code can call functions that live in the C-sharp or F-sharp or any .NET code back in your hub. This is a .NET technology, so you are using .NET languages back here. And it also lets you in your hub make it feel like you can call functions over in JavaScript. Mm, and, cool. and not just JavaScript, because there's more SignalR clients than just the JavaScript client. There's a JavaScript client, which we'll see code for today. There's a TypeScript client. A lot of .NET developers like TypeScript, right? In fact, a lot of developers like TypeScript, period. It's the, I think it's the default uh, template for React and Angular. Pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. There is a community iOS plugin or client. Um, there's a C++ client. And there's also a .NET client. And you say, well, what do you need a .NET client for? This same technology could be used in a WinForms app, in a XAML app. Um, and that kind of gets you to an interesting place where you might ship cross-platform and maybe use the same technology to do these real-time updates. So Yeah, that's so cool. Enough of that. Let's like see it, something happen, right? Yeah. So if you have any questions, let's talk about it while we're switching. That. Yeah, it's important to understand the, the background, you know. The problem we're trying to solve, right? Right. So let's see. And your what pen do I have? skills are strong, man. That was Were they good? <laughs> you know what it really oh, is? Is that magic. Is Here comes the screen. What it really is is that I didn't build uh, any slides. That's what really happened. So I well, said. You don't need slides. <laughs> it's a live show. You know, we're just exactly. we're hanging out. So let's talk about how this works. Um, in fact, I think I don't. I, I, I'm going to see. Let's see what it looks like to start a new application, but we're not going to build this line by line. Um, but I want okay. you to see what goes into it, because if I just show, I think if I just show you the end result, it's going to feel a little too magical, right? So let's let's create a new application. And uh, that's not what I meant to do. Let's, uh, so, and this is a good review for anybody that maybe you're new to Visual Studio or anything like that, right? So. Let's say um, if you say new project and you pick an ASP.NET Core web application. Now, again, we did mention tonight SignalR is also available in ASP.NET 4 on .NET Framework, but we're just going to focus on .NET Core tonight. So I don't want you to think that this isn't available for you. So I'm just going to go ahead and let this be called Web Application 2. I'm not going to worry about that, okay? So I think let's we got um, a fan out here on uh, in the chat. Top Wags Code, the three old guys. That's us, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think he's talking yeah. about uh, or he or she. I keep saying he. Excuse me. Um, I keep moving off screen a little bit there. Sorry about that. So when you create a brand new ASP.NET Core application, I'm going to use the empty template, and the reason why is to so that we can focus on what you do to add Signal R to your app. I don't want to focus on MVC. I don't want to focus on Razor Pages. I don't want to focus on Blazor. You can use this with all of those. You pick your front end. You pick your client framework of choice. Uh, many ASP.NET developers will use React, Angular, or Vue on their front end. And, and guess what? You can use SignalR with that too because the client code is just, quote unquote, it's just JavaScript. <clears throat> so in, a dot, in your typical .NET Core app, we have a program CS that we don't, we're not even going to bother with. There's nothing really to look at here. But if you're if you're familiar with .NET Core, then you're familiar with startup, and st the startup class is where you sort of build your app, right? And when you do nothing more than just do a hello world app, all you get is an application that knows how to respond to a request by saying hello world, and that's it. That's all it knows how to do. So. In the ASP.NET 4 timeframe with .NET Framework, the first thing I would show people is I would show them, okay, let's go get some NuGet packages. Signal R is now built in to ASP.NET Core app. And, and Andy, do you know, can we talk about a little bit about what ASP.NET Core app is? Can we? I, I yeah. hope we will. Yeah. Are you not asking, it, are you putting me on the spot? Or? Well, I'll go ahead and say it. So. In the in the first iteration of .NET Core, remember how we had to bring in all these kinds of packages to do anything, right? And that was frustrating. So we have what are called 
um, I think it's correct that they're called meta packages. And just by referring to this, you get the basics of what you probably need, right? So yeah. there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of stuff that you probably need to build any web application authentication and any forgery token library, cookie policy stuff because of, uh, well, we know about cookie policies being really important to take care of now, cores. And if I scroll down a little bit, we're going to see SignalR is already in here. So I don't have to tell you anything about NuGet packages. We can just get to work, which is cool. Can um, I, you know, it's interesting, though. Like, wasn't the whole idea supposed to be we're not going to bloat your application up with a lot of NuGet pack, a lot of packages that you don't need? Yep. Um, right. I, I thought that was like part of the idea of not getting those in the first place. It absolutely maybe, was in .NET Core. We're going back right, and forth yeah. a little bit. Maybe it doesn't matter because they're so small and they have it happened so quickly. You know, I don't know. I think part of it was, and you know, the team has talked about this, where they're trying to find the right size because asking people to always go and grab stuff from NuGet, well, then they, they miss something and then they get frustrated. But it does have to be the right size because you don't need everything. So it, I agree that that's been a tough problem to solve for quite a while now. So um, tonight... We're, we're not going to use any client frame, any .NET client frameworks. This is just going to be a simple old web page, which you can do in ASP.NET just by simply putting simple old web static files in your, uh, in your www root, right? Which you don't yeah. even get. You don't even get one of those in an empty project. You have to go create that folder separately. You mm -hmm. know, you would go and you would add, I think you can add it through here. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that you can. And that this just... But not only does it build it in, uh, but .NET Core is smart enough to remember that, oh, by default, this is the file, this is the folder that has static information. So .NET Core knows that, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I thought that was cool that it automatically switched and put the icon on there. You know, that that's cool. You know, um, yep. yeah, and, uh, and uh, Top Swag's Top what top swag code is mentioning that you know Golang is is another example where they take the opposite approach. Mm -hmm. They don't put anything in it, even GUID. You know, you want a GUID, you have to download a package, right? Yep. And you know, it's interesting because different people like like different things. It's yeah, hard well, to know now, what you're gonna want. Yeah, and Go has some really great features like the whole runtime and everything gets compiled into can and usually is compiled into a single exe. And while .NET Core has that feature now, I think it's it's getting better, right? That's a feature that you can use, but a lot of people complain that the XEs are a little on the large side. But hey, let me tell you, you don't have to install anything either. Right. So there's something to be said for that. So what I'm going to do now is let's talk about what you have to add to make SignalR go. Um, first of all, there is a service that you add. And so in configure services, you say services.addSignalR. That's it. That's that now includes a signal R service in your ASP.NET web application. The that's second, easy. yeah, that's pretty easy. The second thing that you can do is in the old, in the older versions of .NET core, we would do this, use default files and use static files. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's more correct now to replace this with use file server as this, um, enables all static file middleware except directory browsing for the current request path in the current directory. So it's kind of like a, this is what you probably wanted to serve mm -hmm. HTML and JPEGs and, and JavaScript and CSS, but not the bad stuff. Um, no okay. web configs, right? <laughs> not that there's web configs in <laughs> .NET Core, but no app settings, JSON yeah, or anything yes. like that would get served. Um, and then the one thing you do, you the final thing that you have to do is you do have to map an endpoint. Now, in a in a typical application, you might you might use ASP.NET MVC and serve web pages out through controllers. You might use Razor pages, and so you would still set that up here the way you always have. But I'm going to go ahead and just show you the 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 piece that you have to do for Signal R. Um, and I'm going to replace this code, but you wouldn't you wouldn't actually do this. In fact, I think what you would really do is just add it here. So let me let me just um. So you know, in the use endpoints method, you map the different endpoints, right? 
So mm -hmm. you also add this one. You're saying, I want to map a hub. So we talked a little bit earlier about SignalR's core abstraction is the hub. Um, clients connect to a hub, and once they're connected to the hub, the hub, code in the hub can call methods on the client. Code in the client can call methods on the hub. And you map it by giving it a C-sharp class, and then you got to tell it where to go find that class. And by convention, what we tend to do is we tend to name the hub this way, and then we tend to make a class in our project. Um, and, and, and this is a typed method, you know, a generic method. So you, you pass along the type that's to be mapped. Okay. All right. So I don't want to go one line of code at a time. So what I have here is a more complete application. Let's go take a look at, at now that I've done this on the, on the server side, what does a hub look like? A hub looks like this. You, you include Microsoft.ASP.NetCore.SignalR, or your IDE helps you with that part. The key is you create a class that's derived off of hub. And you can see hub is in that namespace, if, you can, if that tooltip is, is uh, large enough, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you do in the hub is you write methods that you intend to be called from your client. So JavaScript is going to call these methods. That's the cool part. It's an abstraction that JavaScript is calling these methods. Of course, it's calling some middleware that, that translates and, and kind of marshals the call for you. Of course, that's what's happening. But this is the way you can think of it. So we're doing all in one here. What we're doing is we're saying JavaScript can call a method called send message it, that takes two strings. Then what we're going to do is we're going to use the client's property that's built into hub and we're going to send to all listeners we're going to send um, a message that says can you go call the function in javascript receive message and pass it these two parameters and that's this is essentially how signal r works it's a request response system that happens in real time and allows me to fire stuff out to to the browser. Now, I'm kind of making it look here like the only way to do things in your hub is to get a message from the client first. We're going to see later that that's not true, that the, the server can be proactive or the client can be proactive. It's actually um, you know, not unheard of to have an application that's, that's heavy on the hub side. It's sometimes it's heavy on the, on the client side. But the client's got to have a way to connect to this thing. The, the web, in this case, is going to be a website. So how does that look? Let's head over to our index.html. Again, I wanted to, to not focus on any frameworks or anything. So this is vanilla HTML, vanilla CSS, vanilla JavaScript. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing, uh, no framework you have to know to do this, but you can use your favorite framework. <clears throat> if you know a little bit of HTML, this page shouldn't look too complicated. All it's doing is giving us a place to input a username and a message, and mm -hmm. then a button that sends the message. Yeah. Now, we're bringing in the SignalR client library. You got to have this this client library to do anything. And I, if you're unfamiliar with Unpackage, it's a quick and kind of simple way to go ahead and get some JavaScript pulled um, directly from the npm package using kind of this intermediary at at unpkg.com by basically saying, well, uh, what's the new get package? You know, the, um, it's, it's from Microsoft and it's SignalR 3.1.3 and then dive into these folders and get, get that file out. So is, uh, this, is this how you should ship things? <laughs> no, <laughs> but- Yeah, so that's not a, uh, right? that's not, uh, what do you call it? One of these um, where they have like a bunch, where you can post JavaScript files like around the world, a, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Um, no, unpackage is a, is a CDN, but it's a CDN with a specific. Oh, purpose. That's what I was saying. It's a CDN, yeah. but is it, but is it going to, but it, so it doesn't have the, the file you're looking for. It's a CDN that great, that will still sort of go to uh, NPM for you and get yeah. the file. So I'm it's not, not going to pretend CDN I know that has it like pushed out there. Uh, that it I don't have the file. I don't know for sure how it works under the covers, but it's okay. fair enough to treat it that way. What you just said is correct. 
is by saying that you want this package at this version in this file, it's going to go grab it out of NPM for you. How it really works, I don't know. But you can think okay. of it that way. Well, Perfectly fine a, to think. It says it has a cache there, so you don't have to go and do the unpackaging stuff. I'm sorry. So there's a line there that says at the bottom? Oh, where yeah, yeah. So they're probably caching a bunch of stuff, yep. right? Yep. And, and uh, hey, I'm not telling you that this is how you go production. You can use the client-side library manager. That stuff is great. In fact, I think the client-side library manager, the client, the library manager in Visual Studio, I think un Unpackage is one of the options. Um, the reason why I chose this is because if somebody here is not a Visual Studio user, I want you to be able to say, look, I could go host this on GitHub Pages with no project file, no compilation, and it's going to work. Right. So this is not a talk about production. This is just that yeah. uh, somebody who says, I'm really new to all this stuff and I'm actually not, I'm, I, I just don't really know how to get started. So, well, hey, you can go use Unpackage in your GitHub pages repo and it will work. Yeah. All right. So cool. the CSS is not super interesting. We're not going to talk about it. Let's talk about the JavaScript. So I wrote this JavaScript, and again, didn't use any libraries, so I rolled my own ready function, um, just so basically the code that, that actually makes the connection does not happen until the DOM is ready, because I want to wire this up to, to DOM controls. I want to make sure that works. So this is the, the meat of SignalR, and here's where I want to make it clear. These, this uh, object that I'm creating, this is from the SignalR client library, okay? that I included, I included that library here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a look at what, it, what does it look like to connect to SignalR. This might seem familiar. Remember how we declared an endpoint that the chat hub would be on uh, URL slash chat hub? Mm -hmm. So you say, let's create a connection that is a SignalR, let's use the Heb connection builder, let's use this URL, and then let's build. You may be able to figure out if you're familiar with the builder pattern, you can supply more options here. You can do things like say, I only want WebSockets clients. I mean, you can, right? Um, then what do you do? Then you start declaring what your code's gonna do when SignalR calls into you. Back in the chat hub, I had this line of code that said, on all connected clients, call receive message and pass to parameters. What's going what's gonna to respond to that? What's going to listen for that? This is where you're setting that up. Right. So you say, when I get, a, when I get a, a message that says that's called receive message, because that's what I named it. That could be called eat at Joe's. It's just a name. Then run this function and look at the function has two parameters. I don't have to call them user and message, but I did. That helps keep things consistent, easier for you as a developer. And this is the code that will run whenever the chat hub calls this line of code and it'll run on every connected client. So- Hey, our friend, uh, yeah, our friend Kevin of the Griff show, Ke here. Kevin Griff's here, and he uh, says it's one of his favorite topics. So we're yeah. doing something right. If yeah. Kevin's happy, we're all happy, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, this is a cool topic, right? It's easy to get started. Listen, I wanted to ask you, because you showed this JavaScript and I know you want to show us how this how this really works, right? Yep. But I'm curious if I went with a more templated approach and didn't do like, like, do I have to write this JavaScript or is there a version of it that will give me the JavaScript, like, or at least a sample of the JavaScript, you know? I can't think of a template that comes with this built in, um, but there are samples and we're gonna show the GitHub repo with the samples later. Right, okay, so, there's samples. That's that's what I'm going for. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now that, now that I've, declared what my what I'm going to do when I receive a message. Now I got to do the rest. And I remember I told you I wanted to wire this up to to some buttons on the web page. So you call connection.start in order to say, OK, I'm ready to connect to the SignalR hub. And then you get the ability. It returns a promise. So I can say, well, what do I want to do after I connect? Well, what I want to do is I want to take that send button that I started out as disabled so that somebody doesn't hit send before we're ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to go ahead and wire that up. I want to I want to enable that, and then let's wire it up. So we say whenever somebody clicks on the send button, then we're going to get out 
the username and message that they that they uh, put in those two little simple fields. And we're going to call the hub. And you know what? We're going to call send message and pass these two parameters. And we're going to see this line of code come up. So enough talk. One of the difficulties about SignalR is it's really easy to get wrapped up in like, we haven't seen anything yet. Mm -hmm. So let's run this. And I set a breakpoint back in the hub. Right. Um, because what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a browser, a local browser. And here it comes. And it's welcome to the Dev Talk Show chat, right? So I, and again, look, this isn't a chat program with all the bells and whistles and everything's <laughs> secure, but I can put in my name and I can say, hello, everyone. And I'm this in the script now. Check? This thing this, stinks. There's no spell check There in was there? no spell check. Nope. <laughs> now, when, when I remember that this is JavaScript code that fires when I yeah. click send message. But so I click send message and we hit a breakpoint back in our C-sharp code mm -hmm. in the right. hub. Why? Because our JavaScript said to go call send message with two parameters. And what were those two parameters? The name, Chris, the message, mm -hmm. hello, everyone. And what are we now saying to do? We're saying, well, well, call back on all the connected clients and send them a receive message with those two parameters. It's a simple chat program where we're not doing anything. We're not going to a database. We're not getting any data. We're not doing any configuring or any checking or any kind. But what happens back in the client is, oh, why nothing? That, nothing should not have happened. <laughs> What's not wired up that that didn't work? In F12? Uh, yeah, that's true. Let's see what the console says. Oh. Server responded with 404, huh? That's cool. Well, that Let's try that again. See, this time it said connection started. So SignalR does write a little bit of stuff out to the console. Um, can't explain why that didn't work as designed, but there's the message. There yeah, and, then my, that. and then my code basically just starts filling out the code. And this is JavaScript code now. When it gets called, it starts filling out an unordered list. So that's really not super impressive. Like, so I'm chatting with myself, right? <laughs> so what we do is hey, we listen, get... Who's going to listen if not yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> if a chat message is sent across the wire and nobody's listening, were the packets <laughs> used? <laughs> so this is the second browser. And let's put Firefox in here. And because I happen to be using Firefox, let's say, hello, Chris. And when I send the message, both browsers were called. Yeah. And so both browsers did what I told them to do, which was basically say, oh, uh, you just want us to print this out. Let's get a third browser in here. And that's because um, if you go back to the server, to the hub, right, There's it's not just sending it back to a client. I think the code was like notify everyone or something like that, right? I don't know. What, I don't know what it was. Right, and we're gonna go back and take a look at those in a second. But you're yeah, right. Okay, good. Exactly yeah, we'll why. Back exactly why. Yeah. So, so I have three browsers all talking together, mainly because what's happening is every time I push a button here, I'm invoking a function over on the hub, which is then turning around and invoking a function back in the client. It's the simplest possible example. It's the one that everybody says, like, oh, this is, I've seen this before with SignalR. Let's take it, let's yeah. go and peek back at the, uh, did you at use the coding. Edge? Because I saw Chrome and Firefox. Yeah. Chrome, Firefox, so, and Edge were all used. Yep. So on the Dev Talk Show on Wednesday, 826, we have Chrome, Firefox, and Edge all right. talking together, all getting along, yep. singing the like, Kumbaya. This is a historic moment for browsers. So when you're writing code in your hub and you want to send, <laughs> you want to, you want to invoke uh, messages on, you want to invoke functions on your, cl on your uh, clients, you use the client's property. And the client's property actually has a boatload of features in here. All was the one that we used, which says invoke methods on all clients connected to the hub. But you can also do things like this. You can say, let's just invoke a method on the caller. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, maybe, 
maybe I'm joining, um, maybe maybe I'm playing a game, and in the game I can hit a status button, and the status button tells me how many missiles I have left. So it makes a quick signal R uh, call to to query for that, and signal R says, well, I only the caller is the only one that needs or should know this. So let me say clients.caller, send async, and you'll note you can see that uh, signal R heavily relies on asynchronous. The asynchronous pattern, the async await pattern, uh, which you I should do. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, a simpler example is even like, you you know, a client, uh, a caller sends a message to the hub and it may notify like a whole bunch of people that message come in. But maybe we just want to say to that particular caller, thank you. Message received. We got it. Right. Right. And that, you know, that's a nice uh, that's a nice example, too. I think a simple example, you know. Right. No, I don't want this to actually have squigglies. So one of the things you, you notice here is by default, I can, uh, oh, and I didn't await this. And so the IDE is telling me, like, why didn't you, why didn't you await that? It's an asynchronous call. But this is stringly typed, right? It's any method I want over in JavaScript land. There, there are typed hubs. We're not going to get into that tonight, but there are typed hubs. Where you, did you say it is stringly typed? Stringly typed. That's what happens stringly. when we're getting. I don't like know if, if I, you just made that up. I've not no, heard that. No, I haven't made this up. It. No, that's I, a great one. Stringly, like strongly typed, and this the, is stringly typed. The chat will back me up. Is stringly typed programming has been the bane of of .NET in from, oh. from XAML land, right? Yeah. We had XAML stringly typed, and I've, it's yeah. basically the problem being that the compiler cannot possibly tell me. That I got that that call correct, right? right. So, yeah. other things that you can do in Signal R is, um, let's see, um, every every caller has an ID. And let me think, what is it again? How do I find? Oh, okay, so here we go. So. This will tell me the connection ID. Of the uh, of the caller, and any time that somebody, every everybody who makes a connection gets a connection ID. So now I can start doing interesting things, like I can say, I only want to send, um, I only want to send this message to somebody with that specific connection ID. You can say you can start taking clients and you can add them to groups, and then you can say only send them to people in a group. Mm. So this is all stuff you have to set up yourself. You have to write some code that when people connect, you figure out who they are, and then you say, okay, um, now that I know who you are, and you say, well, how? I don't understand. You're saying, how do I know who they are? Well, you implement part of the hub interface where we could say, um, I can do that from here, right? I can say implement the interface, or, or uh, not implement the interface, because this is derived. Uh, is it async? And I think it's task, and then um, on. What I want is I want to override on connected. Oh, yeah, you got okay. the override keyword Connects. in there. Is that what's going to make it pop up for me? Well, what you were doing, public yeah, yeah, async yeah. task override. Connected there. async. There you go. This is what I was looking for. So you have the option to override this. And then whenever a client comes in, this you're going to get in here. And when you're in here, you now have the opportunity to say, well, let me figure out who you are. Let me right. maybe take your connection ID, store it somewhere so that I know who Andy is and I only show Andy his information a little bit beyond the scope of, of the time we have left. So, yeah. But so, kind of, there, just know, down the path of, of extending yeah, that, go right? Ahead. It could be a bit of authentication that happens too, right? You've got some token, you come to here and say, well, your claims in this token say you're part of this group admins, what have you, and we can now send you to where you need to be for this app. Right. Right. So in the chat, there's a dialogue. Uh, and, you know, uh, I believe, uh, you know, Kev, you know, Kev says, uh, don't use connection ID in prod, you know, add, use it for adding to yeah. groups. And, uh, and groups he's saying are... never use connection ID for anything other than adding to a group. But top swag code says sometimes you need to use a connection ID if you are scaling out to more than one server. Now I don't know, uh, you know. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something you're familiar with, Chris? So in .NET Frameworks version of SignalR, are um, 
here's what happens, right? A lot of us run our applications on web farms. And once you once you have a web farm, you kind of have a little bit of a problem because Signal R is using uh, it is using the web server to basically um, it, it's using it to manage who's connected, who's not connected, right? So in a single web server scenario, if you have lots of connected clients, and that's what these boxes are on the on the right, is they're just connected clients. They connect to the hub, so there's a hub here, and he connects to the hub, and he connects to the hub, and that's great until you start until you have a web farm, because now new connected clients are connected to this web farm, and the server the sig signal R process there is actually they're not they're not in process, so they don't get to share this for free. So signal R had the concept of backplanes. And what you did, they had a few supported backplanes. One of them was using Redis. One was using SQL Server. There may have been others. What you did is you connected these to something like Redis Cache. And then what happened is, is when a message came in, this hub would process the message. And then it would also tell the other hubs, the other servers. So this hub would process the message. And then it would tell the other servers, oh, guess what? I got a message you got to deal with, too. It turns out this is complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to see now is Azure has a service called the Signal R service that makes it a little bit easier to deal with this. Because uh, especially as we're all hopefully taking our next apps to the cloud, to the cloud, right? Um, we will. We have a problem where we'll, the moment I want to scale out my application, do I have to like set up a backplane? And so, and I think this is correct that in ASP.NET Core timeframe, the Signal R team, the ASP.NET team said we're not doing the backplane thing. They were hard to support. They're hard to get right. There's lots of problems. You should use the Azure Signal R service. So <clears throat> I have another application here. This is uh, this is called the whiteboard. And we're going to see now that you can do more with SignalR than just chat. This particular application is using HTML's Canvas. And when I draw, let me get another uh, browser going too. What do you mean no connection stream? Oh, that's right. So <clears throat> we're going to have to. We're going to do that. We're going to run this. Uh, we're still going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Just let me. Yeah. Listen, take your time. Let me let me uh, take a mi minute and interrupt here and say. Yeah, go ahead. You know, thanks to everybody that's uh, that's joining us, that's here live with us. We love having you there. We're loving the chat and all that kind of stuff. It's great. Uh, if you're new to the show, you know, uh, you could follow us on uh, Twitch and find out when we're going live. And we hope you'll come back again. If you're not watching us live, if you're watching us, we know all these shows are archived on uh, YouTube. And you might be watching in the archives. And so you could, uh, you know, you could thumbs up. You could like our, our episode if you're enjoying what you got here. And, uh, you know, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Chris is bringing that up now. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we appreciate your everyone being a part of this show with us. Now, look, there's Kev Griffin. You see that? Yeah, there's Kev. That's cool. And uh, and so, um, you know, we just want to remind you also you can uh, you can check us out on uh, Twitter at the Dev Talk Show, of course. And, uh, you know, we're trying to build up our family here. So we hope you guys will uh, stick with us and follow us. And uh, that was my, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, yeah. That was our H little commercial break. break, you know. Yeah, right. So this <laughs> application. Wednesday nights, by the way, Wednesday nights, yep. 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can find us at this very spot here on uh, on Twitch. And then hopefully in a, in a couple of days after that, we'll be uh, episodes will be uploaded to YouTube. So, all right, there you go. All right. Plus so confirmed. this particular app, it um, it allows me to draw with my mouse. Right. And then I can switch colors, draw with the mouse, switch colors, draw with the mouse. I, I'm expecting somebody sharp eyed will notice something in a moment. And just remember, it is a family show. That's all I ask. 
I'm going to bring in my second browser now, just so you can see that all of those. Uh, no, I don't want it to be my new homepage, Firefox. Stop it. You can see that everything I drew was being replicated on the next browser window. Yep. So, so this particular app, it's still using SignalR, and what it's doing is, is that as somebody's clicking on the canvas, they are, they are, they are. Oh, I, I didn't draw enough to the to the left. Let me do that. As they're drawing on the, as they click on the canvas and draw, you can see what happens is, I'm not drawing that box. Um, those coordinates are being sent. I'm going to draw a circle here. Are being sent to the other clients. This particular nice. example. Is, is live so, on Azure. Yeah. This is so cool. This is not just text. It's just right. data. Right. It's just data. Now, why why did I bring this into Azure and, and put it in the Azure Cloud? Because I think what I wanted to show you is the Azure Signal R service now lets me scale that web server. I could that happens to be running an app service. If I scale that to one server, two server, three servers, four servers, it doesn't matter because remember we showed startup earlier? There's a slight change to my startup file. You say services.addsignalr dot add Azure Signal R. And that's it. Uh, all the other, so, so all the other code you wrote, all the JavaScript, all the methods, yes. all of that remains the same. That's the only change you have. Right. And here's what the hub looks like for a whiteboard. We only have one method, the draw method. And when the draw method is called, we basically tell the other clients. That means everybody but the caller. Mm -hmm. Send them a little message with the coordinates of uh, the color, where they were, where they're going, so that that way the other client can render that little delta mark that you're making. And, uh, you know, we can, we can even take a quick peek at the JavaScript. But I'm not – the point of this is not – I don't want to get too lost in what this is doing – uh, this in this particular application, they embedded the script right inside the HTML. It's using HTML Canvas. It's checking on mouse down and mouse up. And when mouse when mouse down and mouse up and mouse move have combined to draw a line, then they go ahead and they call back into SignalR right here with the coordinates, and they say, "Hey, um, SignalR, can you tell the other? You know, why don't you go tell the other clients what just happened?" But I didn't do anything other than develop this application and then add Azure Signal R. By default, you put a connection string for the Signal R um, for the Signal R service. You put that into your app settings JSON, which I'm not going to click on and show you, even though this resource group's all going to go away at the end of the night. And it's not like we have enough people to, I think, really troll my Azure subscription. So here I'm showing you the Signal R service with Azure Mask masking the connection string. So an Azure Signal R service is just really nothing more than just a resource that you create, and then you go grab that key, put it into your settings, and you're done. That's it. That's all you do. All right. So just to be clear, in case someone here is new to to Azure, the Azure Signal R service it isn't. It isn't uh, Microsoft's running this Signal R service. You're running it on your subscription. It belongs to you. You're firing it up, and it's there for you to use. It do doesn't just exist. You have right. to create it's it. A, in it's a platform way. component that you can instantiate in your subscription. It's not like a, um, software as a subscription where you basically buy a license. Right. right. So you basically you create a Signal R service just like you would create an app service or maybe a storage account, or mm -hmm. any of the of the myriad numbers of of um, products that are in Azure. So here's Azure, and, and let's draw a little cloudy thing. Oh, I should have used blue. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so here's the Signal R service. And remember, I talked about the concept of a backplane that was that was needed for .NET Frameworks version of Signal R. In this world, we'll use red for our clients. Um, so our clients are still connecting to some website. This does not have to be an Azure app service, by the way. This is just a web server, or uh, we're not going to get to it tonight, but yes, it can be serverless. This is just a web server. Your web server could still be on-prem, 
mm-hmm. and then use the connection string back to signal our service and let signal our service handle the backplane. That's that's actually cool. So there, there's mm-hmm. a good takeaway there. So I can run signal R. I don't have to be hosted in Azure per se, as long as I have my Azure signal R service, I can do that. But I can maybe add this to some legacy site that might be in my data center, right? Yeah. Whatever it is. Maybe you're in Kubernetes. Maybe you're in a container. Maybe you're in some other some other kind of orchestration system. Maybe you're what do we call it now? Like the Jamstack, right? right. Where it's mm-hmm. a just where it's just a front end hosted in CDNs, so you're not even okay. on a web server, and and it still uses the Azure Signal R service because the front end wouldn't actually be served from the web server anymore, right? So um, even those static web uh, sites that you can create now as well yeah. might fall into this? It's technically possible <laughs> if you re-architect it using all Azure functions, right? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which I really wish we had time for an Azure an Azure Signal R service on Azure Functions demo. But I've, I've always figured whenever I think like, boy, we really don't have enough time to do it, then that's another show, right? Right. So, so we will definitely take a look at that. So enough whiteboarding. That's the whiteboard app. Now, I'm giving you the, I may be giving you a false impression, Andy, that SignalR only works a specific way. And it's that the client calls in to a hub and then the hub calls the client back. Unfortunately, a lot of demos can lead you down that path. And that's not true at all. We have another, uh, let me let me get all this stuff taken out. And I think we have another sample here that shows you that that's not the only way to use SignalR. I like to call this sample the news sample. It's actually called the stock ticker sample. But what it's demonstrating is that sometimes a good use of SignalR is updates you want to send to clients without getting anything from them. You just have news for them. Maybe you've built some kind of dashboard that all your employees, um, they get their tasks for the day to do, and then they check them off, and that maybe goes and registers them in a database. Well, what if you wanted to uh, have a little animation play or maybe have a little bell in the corner, increment one, two, three, four, 34 uh, Mm -hmm. with each new task? SignalR could send the notification to your client code and then your client code would do the right thing. But it's not the client code kicking this off by saying, let me send you a message and then you send something back to interested clients. This is coming from the server only. So let's just see what it does. And that probably will be better than looking at code, right? It'll be more yeah. exciting to see what it does. I've always thought that this this model that you're showing here to me, this is the cool aspect. I've always thought this is the cool aspect of Signal R because it's uninitiated by the client, which you you know you started the whole show explaining you know with the whiteboard how the client calls the server, and that's that's traditional web, right? And that's right. why I think this is this is cool what you're going to show here, you know. So it's going to feel a little hand wavy until we look at code, and. And the reason for that is because, uh, let's see, that's an Edge client. This is a Firefox client. Is <clears throat> because in order just to make the sample all work, you kick off the stock market by opening the market from, from any one of these. And this open market is hitting a SignalR hub and kicking off the market. And what happens is, is in the back, there's a little function that's randomly updating stock prices. It's just making them up. And so that thing's just going to start running. And anytime a stock price changes, it's going to fire that out to the interested clients. So that this opening of the market doesn't have to happen here in the web page. That just keeps the sample constrained. That could okay. be a service. That could be anything else. So when I open and, the market. And these are random. So don't anyone go like yeah. buying, selling stocks based on this demo, right? This yeah, is 100% not real generated numbers that have no relation to anything, right? Yeah. So what's happening here is when a price change is created by this pretend server in the stock ticker solution, it's notifying the hub and it's doing this separately. And I like how they separated this out because in previous samples, they kept that together. And it kind of gave you the impression that like, well, I've got to have, a, I got to go put a hub into my server. That doesn't make sense. I want that code to, 
be separated concerns. I think we had a show about responsibilities recently. So um, in this particular case, you're going to see that there's a separation here where the server is doing the work and then it's it's broad it's telling the signal r hub hey you know can you go update the interested clients so let's go take a look um, as you can see this is running it all looks great let's take a look at some of the code real quick let's see what's right. different so first of all we have a stock class and this is really just a class with some properties in it and then a few calculated properties why is this important because what we're going to see in the hub is in the hub, we actually have hub methods that, um, let me see, where's, where's our hub? Uh, yeah, the stream stocks method, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this get all stocks method that gets called by a, by a client to basically say, um, the best way to demonstrate that would be to, to bring one in in progress. Because you got to find out, like, where are they at? I've just joined. I've just joined. Where are they at? And we're returning. What we're returning through the hub is we're returning uh, an I enumerable. And in an I enumerable of a typed object, a stock class, SignalR breaks that down into its protocol and sends that across the wire. So let's, um, let me, let me show you what that looks like. Here's, we see that this particular stock ticker is going and here is a brand new browser that's joining he's joining the fight right and when he comes in he already knew the current prices because he made a quick call to uh, get all stocks through signal r yeah, and yeah otherwise they're just getting the updates so yep, you want to start off the you need like a and get all what if microsoft didn't update for 10 minutes it would be right. wrong right yeah 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 so you do need that initial burst um it's also using a new feature of, of SignalR in, in SignalR Core where you can stream a channel. And so this is a great fit with the observable pattern. If you use the .NET uh, reactive extensions, if you like those, they wrote these little extensions to observable. So this is extending the reactive extensions, right? To basically say, okay, um, at least I'm pretty sure it's from the reactive extensions. Um, to say, let's go ahead and subscribe to the observable that's just pumping out new stocks. And then we just hand that over to SignalR. And SignalR says, okay, I'll create a channel stream and we'll just keep updating the client for you. So you don't actually have to write code that says like, oh, there was an update, call the clients. There was an update, call the clients. You, you basically write the subscription code and you're done. Hmm. Um, so that's that a pretty cool pretty new easy. feature, right? And it really fits in with the folks who have really taken to observables. Hmm. Let's see, what else am I missing here? But that's like a bonus. You could say that's like a bonus feature, right? Like you don't yeah. have to. Uh, you don't if you're have not to. familiar with observables. Right. Uh, yeah. So I want to show you the stock ticker class. Notice that the stock ticker class has nothing to do with the hub. But because it's going to be running in, in .NET Core, which is inherently ASP.NET Core, which is inherently a multi-threaded environment. And some of these, some of these requests uh, are calling into the stock ticker at any old time. They do implement some thread safety here. They use a concurrent dictionary to store the stocks so you can read them safely. And then they use a semaphore to update when things change. But the point is, this particular stock ticker is handed a hub context. So okay. what it's basically being given in this particular case, and I think you could separate this more, but for this case, I think this is good to at least illustrate that stock ticker didn't have to derive from hub. It can be handed a hub context and that it can make calls as if it were the hub. So basically using the hub context, which is, uh, which is being saved off as hub. Let's go take a look at what some of the methods look like. Um, let's see, where do they use hub in here? I don't know why that was harder for me to find. They get it and they set it and then they don't use it. That doesn't make sense to me for some reason. I didn't forget it. So when they call broadcast market state change. Oh, here we go. Sorry, I just didn't go far yeah. enough in the class. 
So when they call their own broadcast a market state change, they do go ahead and call on the hub and they use the same SignalR syntax, clients.all. Now this ble this blends together SignalR with, with my, what might be your service. You could make the argument to me, well, Chris, that stock ticker.cs isn't necessarily the service. It's, it's like the adapter that knows how to get what's coming from the service and then talk to SignalR. Fair enough. Um, do keep in mind that that's just a sample. I think when you go to production, you're going to have real situations where you say, look, I got this service that's doing things. It needs to tell somebody what it's done. And then that thing has got to know about Signal R. Somebody's got to know about Signal R. I'm not trying to make you believe that in order to use Signal R, you've got to go and infect your original server code with it, which you don't. Yeah. It's flexible. There's like a lot of ways to do this. Not, right. not a lot. Not like there's too many, you know. Yeah. But sometimes you get these things where there's so many ways to do it. It's simple, but there's like there's options, you know. So you need to implement the stock ticker hub. You need to implement that so that you can implement the methods that will be called by the client code. Stream stocks, get market state. We'll go take a quick peek at the giant code, the client code, so you can see the stringly typed use of these uh, of these methods. The hub's got to have these methods, but the stock ticker can be given a hub context, and then it can call those methods as if it were the hub. So let's hey, go take a look. That's at, pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go take a look at www root and look in here and and uh, let's see. They call the JS stock ticker .js. So this is the homegrown code that makes this happen. And remember earlier in the night we said you create a signal R connection on the client by saying where's the hub? It's in slash stocks. And then you start defining what happens when people call. So when somebody connects, the first thing I want to do is call into that get all stocks. Remember get all stocks? Because yeah. I need the stocks. And then... Wait, 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 hang, on, hang on, let me just see if I get this right. Yep. So when someone... Oh, so as soon as someone connects, okay, you're in the JavaScript, so this code is happening on the client. Yep. And when their connection starts, then you're invoking another method called get all you're invoking the get all stocks method which is on the in on the, the hub. hub right here it is yeah and get all stocks is going out to the stock ticker and saying go tell them what go tell them what the current status is then it mm -hmm. also gets market state why is that important it might be open it might be closed if it's open let's stream if it's not then there's nothing to do um mm -hmm. If somebody clicks open, let's go tell the hub. If somebody clicks close, let's go tell the hub. And then like we said about streaming, we were talking about streaming earlier. So you see how they have this built in? Since the other, since the hub returned a channel stream, which is a .NET object, since the hub returned a channel stream, the SignalR client can just subscribe to that stream. And then whenever uh, something happens, whenever it gets a new Whenever it gets a new message, it says, oh, we'll call display stock on that message. And display stock is in here. Display display stock is right here. And it knows how to it knows how to update that cool looking interface that we saw. So again, let, let me um let me do something else interesting here. Um I might not be in that one. <clears throat> Do I have it here? Nope. I'll have to find this. So, Andy, um, this is about the time you probably want to tell us about next week, right? <laughs> I'll <laughs> get this link. I'll get this link going. Yeah, sure. I think I don't. Not positive what next week is, Rich. Are we going to do? Uh, we were doing a series of shows on the solid principles. We were. Um, and we we're also working on lining up some guests and things like that. I think the last I heard, we were going to go back to. The solid principles next week. I'm um, pulling up the meetup right now to make sure, but that's my recollection as well. Yeah, okay, so I will talk about that. So we're doing a five-part series on the solid principles of object-oriented design, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And solid principles are great guidance for building applications that are maintainable, readable. Uh, you know these these important things that we want our applications to be. Uh, I think. Yep. And so and we've gone through the first two. Yeah, yeah. So we did single responsibility and we did the open close principle. Uh, next week, we're going to jump back to uh, the L, which is a Liskov substitution principle. 
And so we'll spend a little time talking about that. We thought it'd be interesting to, instead of cramming them into an hour, which we often do, I've done demos on all five of them in an hour, but since our show is like conversational, right? In the last couple, we've had really good conversations with the viewers yeah. where they, uh, where they, um, you know, have comments and, uh, you know, and questions and things like that. And, you know, Kev says, uh, solid show, gents. Now, I don't know if he's joking, <laughs> uh, talking about this show or the previous show, but it was a solid show. It's a solid, uh, that's funny. It's a funny comment there. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, so we're going to get back on that and, yeah. uh, you know, we wanted to mix it up because we didn't want every show to, in a, it just seemed like it, it could get stale doing five shows in a row. Um, and, uh, you know, let's take a second to talk about um, another comment we got here. So uh, Kayaking is saying, thanks for taking, uh, thanks for so much for this intro, right? I learned a lot. Uh, question, as a newbie to .NET, do you all have a recommendation on where to learn the basics and to begin developing my skills? You know, I think there's a bunch of places we could recommend, but one that is timely is that our friend Jeff Fritz, yeah. who has a, uh, a popular Twitch channel, uh, and I see it right there on the screen there. Uh, we're bringing this up. So Jeff Fritz is doing a series. He just just started this uh, a couple weeks ago where I think every – it might be Fridays. Uh, it's Monday. He's, sorry? It's on Monday. So it's on Monday. So on Mondays, he's doing streams uh, about really like day one, getting started with .NET and C Sharp. Um, and he's doing a really it's, – listen, Jeff, uh, people that know Jeff know. I mean, this is, he's a smart guy. He's, a, he's on the team that does all this stuff. He, he works for Microsoft. I forget his exact title. Probably program manager or program something, manager. right? Yep. Uh, yeah. And um, – you know, worked on the ASP.NET team and all this kind of stuff, and and this is a good place to um, to learn this kind of stuff. And in, uh, and kayaking, it might be perfect timing because it's live, and he's starting at the beginning. And you know, you can ask questions, and he he he, he, you know, he fosters that kind of environment where people he wants you to ask questions and things like that. And he's starting at the beginning. And he's taking it slow. Yeah, he's doing it like you know he's not trying to cram it all into like a one day workshop. He's basically saying let's spend Mondays. I think I don't know if he's doing two hours at a time. I forget. I'll just make these things up as I go. Yeah, but so, I, I, if I remember correctly, it's yeah, something. So like actually, that. he's got his own stream on his channel, and I put the first link in there for okay. that. And that's where he has okay. a schedule up there for the days that he does the C sharp content is actually going to be is on Monday mornings nine o'clock on the Visual Studio channel uh, for Twitch. Right. So, on the Visual yeah, and Studio channel. Yeah. Chris uh, put the first episode. So all of those are being archived on YouTube as well, I guess, from the looks of it. So, Yeah. Now, there are many uh, great streamers. There are many great uh, YouTube places. Uh, I'm trying to think of who does a lot of tips, like Brian Lagunas, I believe, does a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of tips. Um, and uh, I am Tim Corey, who's a friend of the show, who's been on our show here. He has a YouTube channel that has lots and lots of content around. Uh, some of it's free, and, and he does have a subscription basis, so just to be clear. But he, I think a lot of it is free uh, and gives away a lot of that content there on, on YouTube. Um, and I am Tim Corey. He takes a really good uh you know, approach to explaining these things. So there's a lot of places. Um, there's a lot of places out there. And I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to throw out there. Um, for intro topics, you know, there really is a lot. There's a lot of places to go for the advanced stuff. Um, you know, our friend Kev Griffin, who's been chatting on, on here, he has a Twitch channel as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he starts at the beginning like this, but there are a few people that are really trying to focus on getting started as a .NET developer. Yeah, and so I, would definitely I hope that helps. Follow one Kev Griff on Twitch, who's here in the chat. He's part of the Live Coders team, the stream team here on Twitch, which is the team that uh, that Jeff Fritz, um, he's founded the Live Coders and has grown development programming here on Twitch. And it doesn't have to be .NET programming to be part of the Live Coders. It's just about community and having fun coding together. So I do think that series is great because he's starting now. 
he's streaming on he's basically streaming it on Mondays, but then tidying up the recording and putting it up on on YouTube. And I know that one place it's going is the DOT NET channel. There's also um, in the Microsoft documentation itself, there is there are some C sharp learning paths, which I think our own our own uh, channel handle just added to the chat. Yeah, sorry, that was me. I thought it was in yep. my no, browser. that's great. <laughs> it's fantastic. And then uh, I also think one of the great things about watching uh, Jeff's series there, which we which we linked to, is I'm pretty sure that besides teaching people C sharp, they're also building at the same time using C sharp interactive. Um, remember, we just did the show on uh, on notebooks mm -hmm. with yeah. Sarah Sarah Dukevich yep. is. Uh, um, they're building a notebook together using C Sharp that will then let other folks come back and play with C Sharp right there in the browser. Watch the, you know, watch the video. It's like this whole package they're building all at once. So definitely a great place That's to start cool. learning C Sharp, which is which is the usual gateway for .NET. Um, you know, we had our good friend um, Stashu Korek come on and teach us F Sharp, which is another .NET language. Um, you know, definitely more on the functional side. So, you know, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool stuff. So yep. those of you that are, there you go. hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah. Those of you that are kind of sharp eyed, I, I'm really surprised that nobody came in and opened the market while we were talking. <laughs> Although I think part of it is because we weren't on this screen, right, Rich? You were not. We went to the three, three person view. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, definitely learn C sharp with C sharp Fritz, but now we're back here. And uh, we were talking a little bit. Now, this particular example, I did not use the Azure Signal R service, but I did use Azure App Service. I only did that as a contrast. Um, there's no particular reason you wouldn't want to use the Azure Signal R service. One of the things that this does is this does constrain me to one, one server, right? I can't go and click the... Uh, the two or three scale up button on this and expect the messages to flow across that. If I were using containers, I'd have the same issue. The fact of the matter was, is, uh, is I just thought, let's just get this up in Azure so that people could play with this and see this reflecting on their own screens at uh, tdtsstocks.azurewebsites.net. And nobody, even during that whole monologue, nobody came in and opened the market. So if you do and you can, I don't know, maybe it's hard to see the, um, it's possible that it could be hard to see that, uh, that address. That? Yeah. but if you go to that on your own system, you'll see the same prices, the same updates. This isn't, you know, it's not definitely being faked, right. Um, mm -hmm. except for the fake stock prices. Right. So I would go there, except I can't spell, so I'm trying to type it in here. That's a noun there. I, I thought about uh, making like Bitly links, but then I well, wasn't sure. So, so I someone closed, closed the market, market, which is I fine. Made, yep, closed yep. it. Uh, open it again. Yep. Yep. And so you should be seeing this reflecting in your browser too. So I have always, I've always said there's there's three general use cases that I think of for Signal R. And when I say these terms, don't get pigeonholed in your thinking. Let's think about what they are. There's chat, which is something happens on the client, which tells the server to do something and then update the clients. It doesn't always have to be chat, mm -hmm. but but that's the paradigm. But it's chatty, you know, right? Like yeah. it's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. There's the game, which is generally speaking, the server sending lots and lots and lots of updates. And the client also sending updates saying, here's what I'm doing. And then the server figuring out what that means for the whole world and then telling everybody, okay, here's what's happening. Right. That can be a high performance game, like some kind of, kind of like a shooter of some kind, like maybe a little bunch of spaceships shooting at each other. It can also be a, a what I might call a low performance game, but don't make that think that's any easier to write. Like a card game where users join the card game and you need to find out who they are so that you know that these five connected clients are playing in the game and then the server needs to deal them hands, but you only want to deal the cards to each individual client. You don't want to send them to the whole group or somebody in there, somebody who looking at your JavaScript code will say like, oh, all right, I'm going to see everybody's cards, right? Um, 
you can manage all that by basically saying that, hey, here's a group that contains everybody at this particular card table. And then I also have the group of each individual player so that I can send them their individual updates. Um, that, so then the, the third is news. And I consider this app that we're looking at now is news. We're primarily, primarily what's happening is the server is firing updates at clients because of something that's happening somewhere else. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and just uh, to know, kind of do that categorization. So this is news. That's the last one that chat app you did at the beginning. That's that first example you mentioned the game one, even though it isn't really a game, that whiteboard app really kind of falls into that pattern, yes, right? I'm updating exactly something right. somebody else's and we see them all come together. Yep. Exactly right. The whiteboard is more like a game because the, when you start drawing, the client is rapid firing position and Delta data off to the server, which is turning around and rapid firing it back. Um, I used to have a sample, which I don't have only because it doesn't run well on mobile. And so I'm trying to figure out how to how to update this. And then that sample will be back. It was a board game sample where you move tokens around. And in that sample, I was not sending every mouse movement because it was just when you started to get 20, 30 people on there moving tokens around, it really started to slow the server down. Mm -hmm. So I started throttling that and saying the server, first of all, the clients were throttling and they were not sending updates of every single pixel move they were they were limiting that to be like oh only every every 10 milliseconds or so will i go ahead and send an update then the server was turning around and only sending updates approximately every 15 20 milliseconds and it was just to keep uh to keep the performance going and it looked fine like you couldn't even tell the human eye could not tell the difference yeah. um but that sample had some other things going for it too besides allowing people to move tokens around on a board i was also embedding a JavaScript engine so that you could write some JavaScript and like write code that would affect the game. Um, that's that problem has has always eluded me as to the easier ways to solve that embedding a scripting language in your application. It's not impossible. It's just not easy. <laughs> right. So this is a good this is a really good, um, you know, intro. One of the things I like about Signal R is that in in the amount of time we've spent on it, you get, you can really get a pretty good handle on it. I mean, I don't think anyone's expected to write the code that you wrote, like, you know, from memory, from an hour long session, right? But I think you can get a pretty good, or, you know, an hour and a half, whatever it is that we're at, you can get a pretty good feel for what the capabilities are, the basic uh, functions that it has, you know, like this, it's not, um, there's not a, a million options like some other you know frameworks that we talk about where you, you could spend a long time getting getting comfortable with like I don't know like say entity framework or something like there's just a lot you know signal R is just great it does what it does yeah and right and you said something key there Andy when you said I'm not sure everybody's going to be able to write the code you did well that's great because I didn't tonight <laughs> we looked at samples from the ASP.NET Signal R samples repository on GitHub. And I put the link in the chat so everybody can go to this repository. The stock ticker and the whiteboard are almost as is. What did I change? You can see that these samples were updated 10 months ago to .NET Core 3.0. I updated them to .NET Core 3.1 with no changes, no code changes whatsoever. They just worked. Then I went to the whiteboard and I added Azure Signal R service, only code change I made. Then I published those into app service. That was it. The chat sample that you saw me do is not the same as the one in here. And that's on purpose. You should look at this chat sample. There's, it's a great sample. Mine is stripped down even more from that, where I, you saw that I intentionally stripped out client framework, anything. So no jQuery, no React. No MVC, no Razor Pages. It was just let's focus on Signal R with some straight vanilla uh, uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, by the way, I think that's a good idea. I like the way you did that because you don't want to confuse people with. And you said that at the time, like it doesn't. Those other things aren't really critical, and they're not Signal R. They're just other things you could wrap around all the stuff. Yep, right. It's uh, focusing on the Signal R, which is. A little bit of C-sharp to build the hub, a little bit of JavaScript to build the client. If you're using JavaScript, you can use TypeScript, and then there's some other clients too. 
Um, so, you know, here's a Xamarin sample. There's a, a sample for Universal Windows Platform. And the WinForm sample is kind of interesting because one client we didn't talk about is the .NET client. And if I go back to a past life, you know, it's too bad Jess Chadwick isn't here tonight because he would have looked at our whiteboard, not just here in SignalR, but also the one from Microsoft. We, we were building, he and I worked on a project where we built a whiteboard and we were supporting desktop web and WPF. And it was, SignalR was the back end that made that easy for us because SignalR, the, the hub was doing all of the server data management and then just firing off, as far as it knew, it was firing off to connected clients. But then over in our clients, our, our XAML app, our uh, WPF app, and our JavaScript app, they were receiving those messages and then rendering the whiteboard. And even just typing this into uh, your favorite search engine will get you here. And there are full French tutorials here where they'll basically say, hey, let's get you started with uh, ASP.NET Core. You're going to build a little chat app because that's what we always start with, right? Maybe you like TypeScript a little bit better. Okay. Then let's do the TypeScript sample. And yeah, then, I was actually thinking when you were showing all that JavaScript and one, at one of the spots, I was thinking, oh, I would like to see how this looks with TypeScript because I am a fan of TypeScript. I think right. it's a nice way to to do JavaScript, you know. So yeah, uh, there's samples for that too, right? Yep, yep. There's samples for that. Um, try, here's kind of what it looks like. Here is uh, so no, this is just adding event listeners. I'm trying to see when do they actually. Enable communication. It looks like this is the meat of it here. Mm. Create a connection. It looks pretty similar, right? Because TypeScript yeah, it does look similar. Well, all TypeScript, JavaScript is JavaScript. valid TypeScript, right? Yeah. Um, and then SignalR with Blazor WebAssembly, which is the new, uh, the newest .NET Core web framework that takes your .NET, ships it across the wire, and it is, it is hosted in WebAssembly on your browser, which is pretty cool stuff. And, and I think. Might be getting close to some time for some Blazor shows with .NET 5 Preview 8 declaring .NET 5 for November feature complete. Probably getting close to some uh, time to start looking at Blazor again, right? So yeah, longer longer okay. show, but hopefully uh, hopefully this was good, and hopefully it gets you know you interested in checking out SignalR, and and we can do more SignalR. I think a whole show on the architecture of SignalR with Azure Functions is a is an interesting idea. Um, yeah, maybe we'll plan yeah. that one for a few weeks out. That would be uh, really good to see. <laughs> We're on YouTube at video.thedevtalkshow.com. That's where you can find all the replays. If you enjoyed what you saw tonight, head over there. And if you're on YouTube right now, you hit the subscribe button and you'll see every time we get a new video, a recording of this show up on YouTube, you hit the like button and we'll know that these are the kind of topics you want us to talk about. And if you hit the dislike button, then we'll know that you want us to move on to something else. That's fine. Join the conversation. If you have anything to say about tonight's broadcast, no matter what it is, hit that comment section below. And I really want to thank everybody who joined us in chat. And even yeah. I want to, I want to make sure I thank everybody who watched us live. Even if you didn't join us in chat, that is okay. We're glad you're here. That's the most important thing. We love hearing from our friends. We, we do want to hear any advice you have for us, any questions you have for us. And so definitely like kayaking says, thanks again. Thank you for being here. We, we don't have this show without viewers like you, without longtime friends of the show.